Dad? You were always there for me. You were always there for me. And man, we've had fun together. How about that Mexico trip? Things we'll remember. Always horny shirts. Eating chips in the car. Shut up, Job. And almost making love to some roadside bushes. Shh, don't tell mom. <laughs> too dark, too dark. Start the show, start the show. Welcome to Court Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the court cutting revolution so you can watch the stuff you love when you want, where you want, on whatever damn device you choose. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood, and that most certainly was a dark chapter in the, the Netflix original series Arrested Development. Uh, new yes. season, season five, uh, first half came out already. Yep. Have you watched any of it? I haven't watched any of it yet. I have not. Bryce had, and I had a question for Bryce that I'll kick over to you, Tom. Uh, you you read the hoopla about that weird-ass interview where the whole thing was about Jeffrey Tambor, and at right. one point, uh, what's-her-name started crying. Like, that yeah. was that was, uh, that was a weird interview. How do you, why, uh, you watch the show and just don't think of that? Bryce? Uh, it's, it's. It it's a weird thing. It's it's, a, it's too it's too heavy for our cold open. Talk okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. But 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 but, but I'm not wrong for my open. impulse that's, of thinking like that's a hurdle to uh, a, a little bit. There are other problems I think with season. I five. think yeah. what would be even less appropriate would be to throw our guest under the bus and ask him without even introducing him. Kent Fleur of Ritual Misery, uh, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me back on the show. This yes, great. but more importantly, weigh in on on feminism and uh, uh, propriety <laughs> no, in no, the this workplace. Is the second time today you've done. Oh, this. sorry. Okay, never mind. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just gonna uh, say the same thing. Basically, that Bryce said that the whole Jeffrey Tambor thing is just uh, kind of <laughs> awkward. <laughs> uh, I believe you. Uh, but meanwhile, <laughs> luckily for uncle, you, can't not invite to the party, but no one wants to talk to. Is what it feels like. <sighs> I, I, well, I, and to be honest, it's it's way too early. This is me uh, uh, externalizing my inward concerns about going into Arrested Development. I guess I was hoping to hear like, oh, no, you won't even think of it when you watch it. But it sounds like that's not the case. So I'm going to have to do some uh, some uh, considered uh, baggage handling as I go into Arrested Development. Yeah. So put on that orange vest and uh, lift with your legs, Brian. <laughs> you got it, boss. Let's get on to our primary target. So we didn't have a show last week, uh, but two weeks ago, I know that the show discussed the fact that The Expanse was probably going to be revived by Amazon, and that became official. Expanse has been revived for a fourth season. Jeff Bezos announced it at the National Space Society's International Space Development Conference in Los Space Angeles. Uh, <laughs> it was all very spacey. The cast had been at the conference, and he was talking to him about it at dinner, and then during dinner he got the call, and it was all very informal, and then it got confirmed later. Uh, but it's not so much that I want to talk about The Expanse getting renewed, although I'm extremely excited about that. Some notable points to consider in light of this renewal. It's not so much streaming winning over cable here. It's the consolidation of rights all in one place. So consider that even though sci-fi canceled the expanse, they were very much like, but we love the expanse and we glad it found a new home. Sci-fi just ordered an adaptation of the graphic novel deadly class and George R. R. Martin novella night flyers. It's not like they're not taking gambles on new stuff. Fox took on Tim Allen's Last Man Standing from ABC. Interesting note here, Fox produced and distributed Last Man Standing. ABC's like, we don't want to air it anymore. Fox said, well, we make it, let's do it. NBC did the same thing with Brooklyn Nine-Nine. It was an NBC Universal produced and distributed show that got canceled by Fox, and NBC said, eh, well, we make it, let's air it. So yay for The Expanse getting picked up, but the bigger question, Kent and Brian, what do you think this means for networks? Are we seeing the movement of networks into just being the front ends of distribution for production? Man, it's really weird. Uh, now seems as good a time as any for us to to do our best to reconstruct the world as it seems to exist when it comes to the differences between people who write the stories versus those who produce the stories as television or episodic content versus those who distribute the stories versus those who own uh, redistribution rights and so on. Um, you know, so somebody can write a thing 
and they can have a deal that says do whatever you want with it and 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 let me get a check uh for for, for example we talked about uh, the guy uh, who wrote uh, the witcher uh which which has become a very successful video game series uh, which apparently deviates substantially from the original source material uh but now the witcher is going to come out as as some form of of episodic uh television content but uh in either case, it sounds like the guy who actually wrote the original story isn't going to own either of those iterations of the property. And even those people are going to have to seek distribution because maybe in, in, in this area they're able to get it on television, but in this other area it's going to be a Netflix original and, and so on. And it seems to be that the folks who have uh, the checkbooks are tired of getting surprised when they find out that, oh, we do own the rights to this, but we don't own the rights to that. Here's a new rule. How about we just own literally everything we do? Let's take it back to 1949 and let's make the stuff and own the stuff and distribute the stuff and be the or the, the lords and emperors of where this stuff goes, which I don't know for sure how I feel about. It, it could be that this is a responsible thing because it means that the folks who make it will make it with the end game in mind, in which case that's pretty good. But also as an independent creator, this is scary for me because all of a sudden it makes me somebody who, let's say we wanted to pitch uh, The Modern Rogue as a television show, all of a sudden that looks like a squirrelier deal than if they could just buy everything outright because uh, obviously if I were to pitch The Modern Rogue, I would want to be able to continue to do the YouTube uh, channel, but that's going to make it, I assume, a less attractive deal in a world where distributors want to own the rights in all 360 degrees. Uh, Ken, what, what, what do you say? Uh, you know, <sighs> So the consolidation of ownership, I think, on the, the surface sounds good, at least to from a consumer standpoint, because, I mean, look what what Marvel has gone through with with X-Men and Spider-Man and not being able to do everything that they want in their universe. Um, but now it, it, it just seems like uh, when we start bringing everything under one one roof and, uh, you know, owned by one company, it just seems like it it opens up the door to, you know, for the creators to be able to do what they want with their property. Well, and, and, and the middle ground here is, is the expanse. Alcon production is not part of sci-fi and it's not part of Amazon. I think Alcon navigated this very well by saying, well, to get it on people's radar at all, we'll need to do a deal with sci-fi, but let's reserve as much of the rights as sci-fi will let us so that we can then flip it to a new place when we need to and be able to get those lucrative rights. I think there's still a place for independent production companies. What I think is going away is the old situation. Eh, it's, it's too long to get into, but, but sort of the rough back of the envelope picture was, well, you know, each network had a little bit of a different demo, even though they were all going after each other and each network had a great production arm. So a network might come up with a show that they're like, eh, we don't really have a slot for that in must-see Thursdays on NBC, but why waste the effort when that could probably slot into ABC on Tuesday? We'll sell it to them. And now with Netflix and Amazon, they don't have slots. They, you know, they, they don't have a particular demo even that they go after. Uh, they just have everything. We want everything, and especially Netflix, all demos, all types, all slots, all the time. Uh, so it makes more sense for the for the companies to say, well, hold on, if that's going to be the new world we live in, or it doesn't matter when something airs, and it doesn't matter what demo we're going after, uh, we just need to have high quality content, then if we're making any quality content, we should be the ones to take advantage of it. And we'll still go to independent production companies sometimes to fill out the rest of the catalog versus schedule. Yeah, it, it seems like also, and this is a weird thing to say, but I think the quality of the content is almost incidental because what they're really purchasing is a dedicated fan base to a property. And and we happen to really dig the expanse and we happen to think that it's really expertly crafted. The scripts are amazing. The visual effects are extraordinary and we love the world. But we are in that audience that's being bought and sold because I can imagine in an alternate universe, it's some kind of you know independent vlog television show that costs twenty dollars and a taco to make, uh, but if it if they can snap their fingers and suddenly two hundred and thirty seven thousand eyeballs uh, or, or pairs of eyeballs uh, suddenly turn and 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 decide well maybe if I'm choosing between Amazon and Netflix I'll go Amazon because my new favorite you know my favorite show happens to be on there. Um, in a world where people pay 
a lot of money for uh, CPAs, for the cost per acquisitions. This seems like a really affordable play to just buy a certain set of eyeballs. Yeah, because you used to be the eyeballs could only watch one thing at 8 p.m. on Thursday, right? That's right. Now you can watch all three of those things. It doesn't matter when they air, right? You can decide. Like, it's not a choice of, well, I have to choose to watch Amazon or Netflix right now. You can watch them all if you, if you really want to. So having said that, this is let's let's pivot here. We've we've talked about this as cord killers. Now let's talk about it as uh, as fans of the expanse. Do you feel like there will be any noticeable difference in production quality from the before Amazon to after Amazon? Ken, I'm curious what you think so, of that. Well, so I actually just started watching The Expanse. I'm only about probably not even halfway through the first season, but I am absolutely in love with the show. And, uh, you know, so I don't have the whole catalog to, um, you know, fall back on. But I uh, I think the uh, the quality is definitely there under Sci-Fi's banner. Um, I don't imagine that that Amazon would let the, the quality falter at all. Yeah, I mean, the the question is, will they get the budget they need? I can't imagine Amazon wouldn't give them the budget they need. Mm -hmm. They might even get a little more. You know, they, they it might look a little bit better. It would be my guess. Mm -hmm. The other question is, is this going to mean fewer cancellations? I mean, we just saw Last Man Standing, The Expanse of Brooklyn Nine Nine, in the space of a couple of weeks, all get canceled and saved. Timeless also canceled and saved earlier this year, although under different circumstances. I I think there are. There are fewer situations where, a co because of what you said, Brian, because you're buying an audience, where a company will invest so much in a production that they won't want to see it to an end of some kind. Even Netflix realized that uh, when when they they um, oh now I'm blanking uh, on the uh, House of Cards, Tom. It was Sensei. called a Sensei. when they canceled Sensei oh, okay. without an ending. <laughs> Sorry, and then realized oh, took crap, a stab. We really no just want to go for us not to end it. Let's go back and actually give it a real ending. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, and, and um, I, I think that's a smart play because then whenever they figure out like uh, Sensate existed because uh, 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 some eggheads over at Netflix looked at their demographics and they say, we feel like an emotionally driven thing with this type of uh, demographic that appeals to this will do well. And Sensate, uh, it makes all of a sudden there's a dollar value associated with giving a satisfying end to those fans, because now that that satisfying end has happened, number one, those fans now trust Netflix. Also, those fans, that demographic is now waiting for what will next fill that void in their content watching hearts. And so now they could come back and be like, a totally different show. Touch nine. It's another <laughs> show about characters that fit this demographic that I think you're going to enjoy quite a bit. Yeah, I, I love the idea of a show getting a definite end, like the creators having a chance to finish the show. Because one of the most frustrating things that that I ever had to experience with a TV show was, do you remember the show Carnival? It was an old HBO sure, yeah. series. It went two or three seasons, I think, and it just left you out there. And I, I loved that show, and it was just frustrating. And of course, you know, we can always talk about Firefly as well, mm. not – Mm -hmm. um, but that that is the most frustrating thing. So, yeah, I'm, I, I love to see shows get that chance to actually end properly. Well, I, I, I guess my point is, uh, of course, we all love to see proper endings to, to beloved artistic endeavors. But I love the fact even more that there's a dollar motivator to big companies like Netflix mm -hmm. and Amazon to make sure that they end things gracefully so that they keep that demographic happy and in their ecosystem ready for the next thing that they want to show. Mm. Hey, folks, we never want to end gracefully or otherwise. Uh, we want you to keep us going forever. That's right. Immortality is what you're paying for when you support us at <laughs> patreon.com slash cord killers. Every dollar contributed to cord killers goes directly to me and Tom Merritt and Bryce gets a nickel. It's a great arrangement. We all think it's awesome and it should happen forever. Head on over to patreon.com slash cord killers. We got the gang all together. I don't know if you guys heard this, but Tom was missing for two weeks. I was so upset. I heard that he was in Australia, hopped on a plane, went down to go find him in Australia. Wasn't there. He had already come back. But the important thing is that even though we quietly feared Tom had been eaten alive by a koala bear who uh, was like doing a master blaster arrangement with a kangaroo, uh, we 
persisted and gave you the content. Why? Because of your money. And your money should go to cordkillers. Uh, Patreon.com slash cordkillers. Super smooth. I'm nailing it. I'm killing yeah. it. I'm doing great. Plus, you get bonus content where you hear more stories like that one. That's only available <laughs> at patreon.com slash court. That's right. Not only do you get your own RSS feed, but we're doing after time where uh, we, we just talk and sh- and shoot the breeze. It's it's a lot of fun. Same. All of the patrons are are really, really enjoying it. Yeah. And now it's time to tell you how to watch. You tell me how to watch. No, no, it's not like that. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the state of both streaming services and boxes today. Uh, Hulu CEO Randy Freer says the company's live TV service had surpassed 800,000 subscribers. And 21st Century Fox CEO James Murdoch told Recode that about 50% of Hulu's on-demand subscribers pay for the ad-free experience uh, not not the the basic package, which gives you limited ads. Now, insiders told Recode, it's more like 60%. It keeps going up. Uh, for comparison to all these numbers, Sling TV has 2.2 million subscribers. Direct TV now has 1.5 million. And the last we heard, YouTube had 300,000. That was back when we thought Hulu had 400,000. So if Hulu's to 800,000, YouTube probably has more than that. But all of these services are getting close to the million mark now, Brian. Yeah, so... There's two halves of my brain that have uh, uh, two different um, conversations. One of them says, uh, you know, holy cow, not even a million for Hulu. That's crazy. And uh, the other part of me says uh, uh, not only not only not quite a million, but also I can't believe that even 40 percent of people wouldn't want uh, wouldn't choose the ad free experience. But then I take a moment to think back to how Hulu started. And would it be now granted we're what, 10 years into this right now, right? Uh, would it be unfair to say from a historian's perspective, from somebody, you know, now that we have a decade of distance between us and the creation of Hulu, that for those who don't remember, Hulu was created in the middle of, of YouTube being accused of being rampant, essentially piracy all over the place. The Viacom lawsuit was in the middle of it pre, um, I guess, pre Google buying it. Hulu seemed like it was built to fail from the beginning. And despite all uh, indications, it it persisted and developed and grew better and better. And finally, they started offering ad free versions. And it was almost as though reluctantly Hulu got to a place where it's like, well, yeah, we should definitely do uh, what it appears the whole world freaking wants. And when I think about it through that lens, it's not a surprise that in just half a year from 450,000 in, in uh, was it 400,000 or 450,000? 400, 400,000 in January. So in January. So to, so to double, yeah. you know, just in the last half year, it's really the version of Hulu that we see now. This one that encourages people to get an ad free experience, the one that appears to actually want to take on Netflix head to head is really only a year or so old. I, everything we had seen before it uh, seemed to be riddled with compromise and and short of what consumers actually wanted. Yeah, and, and just so so folks are aware, we're, we're talking about three different services, essentially. There's Hulu On Demand with commercials. Then there's the, the 50 to 60% that get Hulu On Demand without commercials, although sometimes it has commercials. Uh, it's, they call it limited commercials. Right. Uh, and then there's Hulu Live, which is a totally separate thing, although it's all in the same app, and that's like DirecTV now, Sling TV, that's the one with 800,000. You got way more subscribers on the on-demand side. And and that's Hulu's long-term bet is they can convert those people into wanting to watch the Hulu live side. And I have to say, it is kind of nice when, especially in the world where PlayStation View suddenly has started to give me the on-demand versions instead of the DVR versions sometimes, which they didn't used to do, which was a big competitive advantage that PlayStation View has now lost. I will go watch the Americans on Hulu on demand because on Hulu on demand, even if they have commercial slots, uh, they get skipped if there's no ads, whereas PlayStation view just fills it with promos. So I also can keep track of everything in Hulu and then everything's all in one place, both my on demand stuff and my live TV stuff. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, well, so, so, it's so, an so, interesting competitive advantage that Hulu has here that they're going to try to bring people in for Handmaid's Tale, get them to upgrade to the commercial free, and then sell them on the live service. So I guess it's that last part that I hadn't really dialed into. The idea that all of this was a funnel that was designed to essentially get people to sign up for cable yet again, only under the name of Hulu instead of something else. 
Yeah. Uh, Kent, Kent, do you think there's anything to this Illuminati theory? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, the, the biggest frustrating thing that I always had with Hulu was the the ads. And now that there's an ad free version, it's it's a much more viable option to me. So, um, yeah, whatever it takes, I guess, to, to bring the eyeballs to their their service. Sure. And according to the American Customer Satisfaction Index, people really do like these subscription services better than cable. Uh, overall, American satisfaction with subscription television service fell 3.1% to an ACSI score of 62, an 11-year low. That only counts cable. That doesn't account over the top. The highest of the cable companies was AT&T U-verse at 70, and Verizon Fios was number two at 68. Dish was third at 67. Meanwhile, in the over-the-top category, Netflix, Sony, PlayStation View, and Twitch all had scores of 78. The lowest-rated streaming provider was Crackle at 68, which would have made it tied for number two among cable providers. Yeah. Number one complaint about Crackle, uh, it, everyone circled dumb name. That would, that's a <laughs> hey, true fact. recommending it because I have to say the word Crackle. <laughs> You're like, hey, man, Crack is whack. <laughs> crackle is wackle. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about hardware real quick before we finish up how to watch. Uh, Apple had its Worldwide Developers Conference announcement today. And among those announcements were some things about tvOS, the Apple TV operating system. Uh, Apple announced they're adding Dolby Atmos support to their Apple TV 4K boxes. Uh, it'll be the only streaming player to be both Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos certified. They'll be doing the same thing where any of the movies that qualify for the free 4K upgrade will get automatically upgraded to Dolby Atmos. Of course, you'll have to have the speakers to take advantage of it, but it's there. Also, I think more appropriate uh, and interesting to this audience, they're partnering with cable companies. So Apple is going to partner with Canal Plus in France, Salt in Switzerland, and Spectrum here in the U.S. later this year to provide apps that work with the Apple TV app. So the way that, for instance, if I watch a show on, uh, on let's say, HBO Now, it'll show up in the TV app and keep track of it. Or if there's a live broadcast of a sports team I'm interested in through one of the connected apps like ESPN, that will show up in the TV app list. Uh, Spectrum will be integrated into that for its service. So you could pay for cable Never hook up cable. Use your Apple TV as your cable box and have it hooked up to the TV app. And they've got something called zero sign-on. So instead of single sign-on, where you sign into the Apple TV and then it automatically signs you into all of the individual apps for the various broadcast networks, if your ISP and your TV provider are the same, so in, in, in this case, you have Spectrum for your internet and Spectrum for your cable TV, it will detect that and just sign you in. You won't even have to put in a password for ESPN, Fox Now, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a couple other things. Apple TV remote icon is going to be added to the control center on iOS, so it'll be easier to get to. And uh, you can also add some third-party remotes like Crestron Savant and Control 4. What do you think of this partnership with Spectrum? This sounds to me like the complete realization of of our prediction of the fig leaf uh, cable model. The idea that you'll get cable without getting cable. It's like, look, we get it. You don't want cable. Everyone hates cable. Heck, we're the cable company and even we hate cable. But you want Internet, right? Let's say you buy some Internet. And look, I understand technically you're supposed to have cable. But let's say you just sign this line and for $30 more a month, you get sign ins to all of these things. Only very quickly, they immediately turn around and knocked on your door a second time saying hey man sign ins a real bummer right let's say we have no sign ins and i know what we're describing looks an awful lot like buying cable but trust us it's not cable you're not buying but cable you're also going to get an app that's very much like a sling tv or or a playstation view on top of all of that uh, yeah no I, I i to be honest tom i'm sure there's a lot of implications and a lot of things to discuss but all i heard you say was you sent a telegram back to 2014 saying uh dot 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 you're right Stop, uh, Brian, you and Tom, you're right. Stop. Uh, end message. Stop. Please stop. You're ruining the future. Stop. <laughs> I mean, I, but, 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 but tell me this isn't exactly what we've been predicting for years. Oh, yeah. No, it's 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 slipping in there. And it, and it's what we kind of thought Apple was going to do in some way anyway. I guess they're just doing it with a cable company instead of doing it on their own. Kent, what do you make of this? Yeah. Are we right and or how right are we? <laughs> 
I, no, I think you, I think you're right. But on the surface, this just sounds like cable to me. And, um, I don't know. I kind of get lost in the weeds with with where their like end game is with this. But I tell you what, one thing that that excited me about this announcement was being able to use third party remotes with Apple TV because yeah. that remote is garbage. So this is interesting. Uh, let, let me make a case for why. And I understand getting lost in the weeds with cable and, and, and disliking cable a lot. But, you know. I don't know if even we knew the future implications when we decided to launch Cord Killers with a core message of the show dedicated to teaching you how to watch what you want, when you want, and whatever damn device you please. You'll notice that we don't say, and save the most money or have mm -hmm. the most convenient bill structure. We say it's about watching what you want in the easiest way possible. And the fact mm -hmm. is, originally, five years ago, uh, six years ago, we were talking about how badly we wanted a la carte. Senator John McCain was putting motions out on the floor saying everyone should be able to order individual channels. And it turns out that maybe the right way is weirdly the cable method. It's just that we hate the menus and the knowing of channels and the on appointment, figuring out what time stuff comes on. Because I'll tell you what, man, when they make it this easy and they're making it very, very easy, it's a lot easier for me to open up my 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 wallet to and, and get comfortable with the idea of spending some money on cable. Yeah, it's about yeah. control. And uh, maybe this looks like cable, but you do. Uh, when I say you, I mean one, you know, people do want live television and there's lots of ways to package that up. Uh, Sling TV is kind of like cable television. So Spectrum competing there, I think, is a good thing because instead of, well, you got one cable TV option unless you want to put a satellite dish on your roof. Now it's, well, you've got 16 different options of various flavors. Some of them are like cable used to be. Some of them are like Philo, which is a slice of cable. Others are like Netflix that are totally not like cable, but they have their own advantages. Uh, you know, this is going to shake out into some traditional categories eventually. But right now we have way more competition than we have ever had. We won't see the price structure shake out until the momentum builds and more people enter this marketplace until that 800,000 number is an 8 million number, a 15 million number. But this is the beginning of it. And this gives you way more control. What's going to happen is I canceled my TiVo guide service because I've not been using the TiVo lately. I had to call them to cancel it. I'm like, eh, that, that's not going to last. Uh, mm -hmm. When I can go to Sling TV and turn things on and off at will, same thing with PlayStation View, those are the companies people are going to want to choose because you have so much choice, You that will have an effect and people will move to those companies. So if anything, seeing Spectrum come into this marketplace, I'm like, you better improve your game, man, because they sent me um, a, 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 a letter, a physical letter that said, hey, <laughs> I like the fact that it took you a moment to find the word letter. What's that called? You're like, it was, I don't know. It was on it dead wasn't trees. It wasn't it an email. Oh, it, it was just was, mail. It was so weird. Right, don't eat. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So they sent me a letter and it said, Hey, sign up for spectrum without needing a cable box. Just use the Roku, et cetera. I'm like, great. I want to sign up. So I went and logged, I went to the page and said, you have to log in. I'm like, okay. Uh, so I gave my zip code and I was like, which address are you? I'm like, why does that matter? Well, okay, this is my address. Oh, uh, we took you to a page of a bunch of offers, none of which are that one. And it's like, okay. So I called and I was like, okay, I want to take advantage. I guess I'll call to figure it out. So I called and I got put on hold and it said, your wait time will be, and I hung up. Yeah. I'm like, nope. I'm sorry, if I can just go on to Sling TV, PlayStation View, Hulu, YouTube TV, and sign up right there, why would I ever leap through all of the hoops you're making me leap to sign this, up for Spectrum? This is one of the most delightfully counterintuitive parts about the latest generation of, of cable-like experiences, is weirdly, the easier you make it to cancel, the more likely you are to get people back. I have canceled stars twice because I didn't have anything at that moment I wanted to watch. I went back very quickly because it was so easy to cancel. Same thing with Sling. Same thing with PlayStation View. Like, weirdly, the easier it is in both directions, the the more fluid your, uh, your allegiance will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, according to estimates from Parks Associates, Roku is still the market leader for streaming devices, holding steady at 28%. Uh, also close to 28% is Fire TV, up from 24%. Uh, Apple stayed steady at 15%, and Chromecast is the one that's fallen behind. People are not using Chromecast anymore. That fell to 14% uh, 
of the market from 18% last year. Uh, more than 3% of consumers cut the cord last year. That's the highest rate on record. And 40% of households with broadband now have a streaming device. So if I was going to speculate wildly and without any basis, I would say mm. that, that Roku almost certainly is establishing its market dominance by partnering. Like this business with TVs that come with built-in Rokus was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And I think that's a big part of it. Uh, likewise, I think that fundamentally the Chromecast, it being an intermediary step, the fact that it's just a bridge, the fact that you all that you still need a, uh, a, a, a you know a, a cell phone or whatever to uh, to cast it to the receiver, I think that addition of an additional step is uh, what's killing it. Yeah. At first, it was like, ooh, cheap thing, easy to use, and then people started to see, well, it's not that much more expensive for a Fire TV, and or it's an Roku. extra step, and yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, also, by the way, I said the numbers wrong. Roku is at 37% market share, Fire TV at 28%. Which which device, if any, do you use, Kent? Yeah, I use the Apple TV 4K. And it, yeah, it, it, like universally, is there no other similar devices in your house? No, I've got the I've got the old style like second gen Apple TV, but that's really the only other device that I've got. Yeah, I think that speaks to something we've talked about on the show a while is once you buy content in a single uh, a particular ecosystem, you tend it tends to create a gravity well that just attracts you more and more. Like uh, here, I mean, I do use the, the Roku on the upstairs and downstairs, but all of the content I buy is automatically on Amazon just because I know that's where all my content lives. Mm hmm. All right, let's talk about what to watch in Under Surveillance. Of course, we mentioned at the top of the show, Arrested Development Season 5, now live on Netflix. Netflix also released stills from Matt Groening's upcoming animated series, Disenchantment. io9 describes them as picturing hard-drinking Princess Bean, Abby Jacobson, who decided ruling a kingdom is boring and sets out on a series of misadventures with an elf named Elfo, played by Nat Faxon, and her very own demon, Lucy, Eric Andre. First 10-episode season is coming August 17th. Uh, and then all of a sudden a portal opens and Rick and Morty show up and then it's just one episode. <laughs> oh, you think it's a, it's, it's slagging on Rick and Morty? Oh, no, no, because no, no. It's supposed I, to be I, the fantasy version of Futurama. Uh, I, I, I just think that, uh, we live in a wonderful world where, uh, as I age and, uh, my generation has money, they do more absurdist stuff meant to appeal to my demographic. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, no, I absolutely love Futurama. So this is this is probably going to be right up my alley. This Hollywood Reporter and Variety each cite their <laughs> that own. That is sources. definitely Bart. This, that, just that, Bart that's just it. Goblin Bart. He even <laughs> has a exactly spiky like hair. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I think Fry was just red-haired Bart, really, when you think about it. Fair enough. And without yellow skin. Uh, Hollywood Reporter and Variety, each citing their own sources, say that director-writer James Mangold, you might know him from Logan or 310 to Yuma, and producer Simon Kinberg, who produced The Martian and Logan, that's probably how he knows Mangold, have joined the Boba Fett project. Uh, also, apparently, the Kenobi film still doesn't have a writer. I am really struck between two thoughts that are at war with each other. One is Boba Fett is awesome, and I hope this show is great. Uh, and I think that's the dominant one. But there's a quiet little part of my brain that says, if Boba, Fett, Boba, if Boba Fett was so great, how come he lost in a comedy sight gag and died in a burping butt? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I don't know why we venerate Boba Fett so much, but I hope it's great. I mean, yeah, the way you die doesn't define your life, does it? Oh, uh, it does for Boba Fett. He'll be the guy that a blind <laughs> man accidentally comedically bumped and landed in in a in a in a in a burping butt. I've wanted a Boba Fett movie since I was ten years old, so bring it on. I mean, if it's like a Logan, totally. Dude, yeah, it's like yeah, a bitter absolutely. old jaded. He's like, uh, what does it matter? I'm gonna die in a comedy sight gag <laughs> to a burping butt anyway. I'll probably end up, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Warner Brothers is producing an animated adaptation of George R. R. Martin's children's novella, The Ice Dragon. It is not in the Song of Ice and Fire world, despite involving dragons and ice and everything. Hollywood Reporter says Martin may even write the script for the movie. I would love to believe that the cover of this children's book says, The Ice Dragon, asterisk. And then you look down and it says, Not that one. <laughs> That's the, the reissues. Because he wrote it before he wrote Game of Thrones. So yeah, every new one has to put that asterisk <laughs> on there. 
Uh, the Venture Brothers Season 7 uh, was supposed to debut in November, but Chris Pranoski, producer at Titmouse Incorporated, an animation company that does work on Venture Brothers, maybe mistakenly, told Forbes it will debut this summer. Ken, I'm going to assume you're like me and that you deeply loved the Venture Brothers at some point, and I'm going to assume that you're also like me, in which I can ask you, when did you fall off the Venture Brothers? Oh, my gosh. Um, so this is the part where I tell you that you're dead wrong. I've never actually watched the Venture Brothers. Okay, Ken, it was nice thinking we were friends when it happened. <laughs> But uh, no, 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 I loved, love, love, loved uh, the Venture Brothers very deeply. And I, I, for the life of me, I can't point to the moment where I, I think it was when I gave up cable and Adult Swim stopped being part of my Sunday night ritual and it stopped automatically showing up in front of my face. But I think I owe it a complete rewatch from the very beginning and uh, just to That's get caught up for this. That's why stuff like the Apple TV TV app is so essential in this new world. It is the new way to know something's back, right? Because it's like, oh, we know you like Venture Brothers, new episode, and you won't miss it. Because uh, I missed an entire season of Venture Brothers. I eventually went back and found it, but I had to make an effort, right? And that's that's not going to work. You got you, you, you got to make it easy for people to watch the stuff. Exactly. Uh, second half of the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt's fourth and final season will come to Netflix January 25th, 2019. The uh, first half just came out, so you can catch up to that and then wait until next January, I guess. Uh, and season two of Netflix's Queer Eye will premiere on June 15th with eight more episodes. In an interview with E.T., the new Fab Five say the second season is about inclusivity and includes makeovers of women and members of the trans community. Uh, season one, if you remember, premiered this past February to wide accolades. Now, Bryce, you were saying that this was sort of a big surprise. Like all of a sudden they announced, uh, by the way, it's back. Also, it's out. Yeah, it was like I, I only found out because they put out some clip of the new version of the theme song for the second season. And it just says at the bottom, new episodes coming June, whatever, June 15th. June 15th, yeah. And next week. You would think like Netflix does a lot of like date announcements, big, you know, heads up. But this is so soon. I mean, they, they have to be tripping over all of the new content that they have. I'm sure there's somebody who's tearing their hair out in promotions trying to figure out what order is like. It was easier when we had one a month. And now it's like, no, no, no. Every two days announce yeah. another thing that we have. Yeah. I. You know what? It just put two and two together. Uh, Eileen told me that the she got to meet these guys because they came by for an interview at Rotten Tomatoes. And now I now I know why they're promoting it's because they're promoting this new season. But yeah. it, I mean, they're obviously doing the work. It's just hard to get the message out when there's this much stuff constantly premiering. Yeah. Well, and especially because like the value of Netflix as a brand is that it's one channel that has one set of eyeballs and all of their attention. And that is getting crowdeder and crowdeder. That's that's legitimate use of the English yeah. language. Yeah, oh, that's the proper. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, no, I think th they also said that they shot season one and season two at the same time. So that's uh, probably why it's coming back so soon. But even then, you look at like Kimmy Schmidt is going to have six months between yeah. their two seasons. We don't have a date for the second half of Arrested Development. You know, I, it's it's weird. That and they dropped they're Arrested Development on us at the last minute too. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, finally, Netflix has shared a trailer for its first comic book. Remember, they own Miller World. Uh, the Magic Order will hit shelves shelves on June 13th. Yeah, it's a trailer. Yeah, it has Netflix branding, but it's a book, not a movie or a TV show yet. So this is this is where you get into the weeds on. Uh, oh my God, they're depicting the bullet catch. This looks phenomenal as a as a uh, fan and promoter of magic. This looks awesome. Um, I understand the per purchase uh the purchase of the comic book company for all the back catalog of ideas that they can mine for all this stuff i understand the intuitiveness of saying well we own this thing might as well use this marketing engine that we have wouldn't this be huge for uh for the comic book industry but i do feel like netflix means something as a brand as a name and i feel like using that channel to promote a comic book is just off brand enough that i I, I would need to be convinced of the value of this. It seems like it's something that that uh, uh, dilutes the brand of Netflix and doesn't bring a lot of credibility to the comic book. I'm wondering if they're doing this as just like a because they bought the catalog, right, of, of this uh, uh, these creators. Uh, Miller World, um, right? Miller yeah. World, right. Yeah. So now are they using this as a test ground for like if, if people like the book? then they will adapt it for for Netflix yeah. as a show. Well, and, and the catalog, and I, they don't have the rights to adapt because those 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 have already been sold to other people. 
I see. Okay. Okay. I guess that makes sense. I, I'm this with is you, the Brian, first that original to come off-brand. out since Netflix bought the company. Right. So I, I I see where you're coming from, Brian, that it seems off brand, but I think it's a smart strategy long term or it could be anyway. I don't know. I, I, I'm in favor of experimenting, but uh, I, I would say like if they kept doing this, I don't know how good an idea that would be. But I, I think that you nailed it right there. Like doing it this once doesn't dilute the brand because the brand's so big. Right. Right. It's just maybe a little bit confusing and it might be worth trying because it gets people to realize, oh, Miller World. Right. That's part of Netflix now. Uh, and, and maybe mm-hmm. you can tie it to a, a property when it comes to Netflix later. And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, there's a, a part of this comes from a personal experience. You know, one of the things that we're doing over at the Modern Rogue is we've got the, the Modern Rogue YouTube channel, which is me and Jason trying experiments and stuff. But we're also building the the, the printed word version, the articles. And uh, uh, as an experiment, we sort of ran a video of, of me and uh, Jason talking through uh, five outrageous con men and telling the stories, basically doing a book report on the uh, the article. The hope, of course, being that it drives uh, uh, the video viewers to the website and vice versa. So uh, but uh, it's an experiment. We don't know if that's going to end up being a good idea or not. So far, the fans seem to be overwhelmingly really, really dig it. And so certainly if Netflix find themselves in the same position, then great, by all means, continue to do it. Although that does seem like a bit of a surprising leap to me. I'll, I'll do a video on the unexpected origins of five common practices because most of them were from my trip to Australia. Like what? I, 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 like tipping and oh, driving on the left. I, okay. So I had to totally ask my my uh, uh, driver. I was just like, so tipping culture in Australia. He's like, yeah, don't. Just don't. No. You round up the taxis. That was the, the only thing a local told me. Like, you know, if it's $24, give them $25. That's fine. Tell them to keep the change. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about what we're watching. Kent, starting with you, what's been filling your eyeballs up? Yeah, solo a Star Wars story, of course. Uh, watched Deadpool two for the second time this week. Oh, interesting. Uh, finally, so you did watched not Cobra see Khan. Solo to see Deadpool two. You saw Solo and Deadpool two twice. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Um, I I watched Cobra Kai. I binged that. Um, I finally got a hold of uh, Star Wars Forces of Destiny, the the YouTube series, uh, the the series of shorts. I had never really been interested in that until like this past week. I was like, you know what? I'm going to binge it. It took like, I don't know, 45 minutes to watch the entire catalog. And it's uh, it's kind of neat. Um, other than that, uh, I started watching uh, season one of The Expanse finally. And my son and I have been watching the NBA playoffs. Uh, which service do you use to watch the playoffs? Yeah, uh, Sling TV. Oh, there you go. See, yeah. people are always like, well, but what about sports? There you go. So you non-spoilery, know. since we already spoiled it on Spoiler in Time, but uh, Cobra Kai, I assume since you watched the whole thing, you enjoyed it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they they, they give away the, the first two episodes on, on regular YouTube for free, right? So I, I watched it just to see, because I, I loved Karate Kid when I was a kid, and I watched him and I was like, okay, yep. I, I immediately hit that button for the free trial for YouTube Red, and yeah, I... I it was amazing. It was, it was everything that I just dreamed that it could be. It was, it was corny. It was uh, very smartly written, which was kind of a surprise, I think, because of the level of corniness in it. Uh, but it, it leaves you uh, with the same kind of feeling at the end of it, like where the, you know you, you're excited to see who's going to win, um, and then the surprise ending. I don't know on spoiler time. I don't know if you guys talked about the the kind of the surprise we, we, ending. We, we did not talk about the surprise cameo at the end because it was me and Bryce talking, and Bryce <laughs> I, I didn't know who it was. I just knew that it was probably someone from the movie. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. lots of fun. I, I I really enjoyed that show. Uh, yeah, and and I think you nailed it. Like the surprise to me is that it's able to fuse really smart writing with really corny delivery, and and I kind of adore. I adore how corny all of it was. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I, I watched a lot of things over the last couple of weeks, uh, when I've been gone, uh, watched a lot of movies on the plane ride to and from Australia. The one I'm just going to pick the one movie of the like five that I watched, uh, that, that I that still stuck with me. And I could mention without having to look down at my notes was darkest hour. Uh, I, I, in fact, I wanted to watch it over again, uh, on the plane ride back. It was that good. Uh, really, I'm, you know, I'm a sucker for history, especially British history. Uh, but his Gary Oldman's performance as Churchill was amazing. Uh, so, so big props to that, even on a tiny screen. One thing I watched on the 
in in de- you know in seat screen on the way over mm-hmm. on the way back i was like screw that i have an ipad so i pulled out my ipad pro and they have the wireless movie streaming in the cabin i was wa- i was watching the movies on my ipad it looks so much better uh wild and uh, you know it's really interesting those movies that either get an upgrade or a downgrade by being on the small screen and uh, it mm. sounds to me like this is the kind of movie that would probably be better on a big screen but uh but but seem to play fine on the small screen what about yourself? Dude, I went and saw Solo yesterday. Oh, yeah, uh, I saw that too. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that in spoiler in time. Uh, watched uh, two weeks of Westworld, got caught up because I was out in Australia. Uh, I am still catching up on The Expanse. My plan was to uh, watch. Uh, we, we actually di- pre-downloaded all of them so I could get all the way caught up. And then we sat down and we're like, okay, episode seven, let's get rid of and I fell right asleep. And then, uh, uh, and of course, two episodes of Deadwood, which we'll talk about in spoiler. Inside. I actually watched two episodes of The Expanse on the plane ride home, which I had to, uh, you, you, they don't, aren't out yet in Australia. So I had to VPN to buy them from iTunes from my US account and download them so that I could watch them. On oh, the that's home. amazing. Yeah. Uh, Bryce, what should we be on the lookout for? Hey, we got a recommendation uh, for an Amazon original series from... Uh, where is it? Rick from Rick. He says, uh, Rick from Orlando here. I have an on the lookout for you guys, an Amazon original called Britannia set in 43 AD in pre England. A Roman general brings his army back after getting crushed a few generations ago and finds warring tribes along with the mystical druids. The show has a Vikings type of feel with a bit of Rome uh, and even a mini game of Thrones feel with the mysticism and supernatural elements. I watched six of the nine episodes and I'm liking it. Uh, check out the leader of the druids, Varen. Uh, it's easily the creepiest TV character in many, many years. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, there are nine episodes of this on Amazon Prime Video now, and a second season has been ordered. Have you guys? Uh, do you any? Have you guys seen? Britannia? I have not seen nor heard of it, but mm-hmm. from the preview I'm looking at right now, man, are they fans of massive close-ups on people's faces? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the characters. I have, I have seen the first episode, but I've been meaning to get back to it. Yeah, I, I only got a chance to watch about 15 minutes of it today, but it's it definitely seems like a. He's right in calling it like a Viking slash games of Game of Thrones Game of Thrones e show <laughs> crossover sort of feeling. So uh, check that out, Britannia on uh, Amazon Prime. If you got something we should be on the lookout for, email us cordkillers at gmail dot com. Uh, real quickly, I am trying to get a sequel to my book Pilot X published. It's called Trigger. It's a time travel adventure. And I'm doing it through Inkshares. Their deal is if you can get 750 people to pre-order a book, they'll publish it like a real publisher. Put it in stores, market it, put it in Publishers Weekly, et cetera. Uh, But I need people to order it. So I need you to check it out. If you liked Pilot X and you want the sequel, uh, or if you're just interested in a good adventure story that involves time travel and coffee and pie, go check it out at tomsnewbook.com. Let's move on to the front lines. Plex released a redesign of its Android and iOS apps, adding beta support for podcasts, as well as more personalization options. Uh, You can remove default categories from the home screen now and add new categories like on deck and continue watching, which let you pick up from where you left off on other devices. And there are now tabs on the bottom for movies, shows, the new podcasts section and more. Ken, are you uh, you a fan of the Plex? Do you use the Plex? Um, I've used other people's plexes, uh, <laughs> but and that is what an so adroit thing to say. That that is uh, that is the universal answer I always get is everybody's trading everybody's plex accounts. <laughs> There's only one account. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Meanwhile, a recent study from the Pew Research Center reports that teenagers use YouTube more than ever. 85% of teenagers aged uh, 13 to 17 say they use the platform compared to Instagram at 72%, Snapchat at 69%. As for Facebook, compared to a 2015 report uh, surveying teen use on the platform at 71%, that number has dropped to around 51%. Do you think Facebook is going to give up on video? What am I talking about? They're not, they have all the money in the world. They're not going to no. give up on anything ever. They're just going to keep plowing away till they hit something that works. But yeah, I mean, who knew that the hot new social network among teens is YouTube? I'll tell you what, man. Uh, I've got two different daughters that live in two different ecosystems that that they have their own heroes and their own villains and their own world and their cast of characters, their virtual friends that they watch as they, you know, one watches them play Minecraft. The other one watches, you know, stories be written about dragons and whatnot. And uh, 
uh, this fragmented reality. Like, like I am more aware now than ever that, that you and I are the, 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 end of the long tail of, of the monoculture that existed in the 70s and 80s. Goodbye, mass media, huh? Yeah. Uh, former NBC exec Jennifer Salk, now head of Amazon Film and TV, announced she has hired former NBC producer Vernon Sanders to co-run TV at Amazon with Amazon's Albert Ching. Sanders oversaw saw shows at NBC like The Blacklist, Friday Night Lights, and 30 Rock. Man, I I did watch Friday Night Lights, but uh, but I missed out on the whole Thirty Rock thing when it happened. Wait, Can't, did you ever see Thirty Rock? No, I, I I've seen mm. an episode here or there, and I know they're great, and I know many of the cultural references. What about the Blacklist? Um, oh wait, that, we're still under fifty. Never mind. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. Uh, China's movie and TV streaming service, uh, uh, IQ, I, 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 <laughs> opened its first theater with Dolby and THX sound popcorn, fancy seats and such. It'll let people book private on-demand showings. The photo in the South China Morning Post shows a small theater that looks like a screening room. I just think this is a fascinating take on that idea of the, of the streaming service owning a theater. They didn't buy big theaters. They bought bought screening rooms or built them is what it sounds like and said, hey, it's like karaoke. Get a bunch of friends together, and sit and watch one of our movies together well, and with snacks. Think about little things that you would never consider in a big movie theater, like the ability to pause the feature or back stuff up or whatever, where it's like if you if you and, and five of your friends rent it, somebody's got to pee. There's no there's no evaluating like, well, is this does this scene have Captain America in him or not? Uh, let me get out of here. Yeah. It's I I don't know Kent uh, no cleanup but would you rather do this than being at home? Uh, no I think this would be great for you know not all the time um, but I, I think it would be a lot of fun to go out and do because like when I lived in Japan and Korea like the big thing was the uh, the karaoke rooms where you just basically rent a room and there's like five to eight of your friends in there and this this sounds wonderful I'm all for yeah. it and have people bring you snacks yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, MoviePass's parent company Helios and Matheson now has an exclusive option to acquire the library and production slate of EFO Films, Emmett Furla Oasis Films, and the two are launching a new nameplate called MoviePass Films. MoviePass is scheduled to release two movies in June, including American Animals and a co-production with EFO Films called Gotti, starring John Travolta. Randall Emmett of EFO Films said, what impresses me the most is that MoviePass can guarantee box office attendance, which is a game changer. Man, this is that end game that we've been predicting they've been going for, man. Is like, first, start writing checks. Two, see how many eyeballs you get. Three, uh, start acting like you own people. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you're and, buying eyeballs. I, I mean, it's a crazy move, but it's a real move. This is not, I mean, they've got John Travolta in a film about John Gotti, right? Like, that's a real film. So, Movie Pass Films, here we go. Well, you know, in a year from now, we'll either be talking about, wow, what a spectacular flame out that Movie Pass was, or wow, what a spectacularly genius idea that Movie Pass was. It's a it, bold it, it, play. Be like uh, one or the other. Kent, have you have you messed around with the Movie Pass at all? Yeah, I, I picked up Movie Pass a, a few months ago when they had that like super low price for it, uh, right before they started changing all the the plans and everything. Um, I love it. It uh, the this move into films like this seems very sudden because I, I agree ago, I, it's happening much faster than I would have expected. It used to be this is the kind of thing you would take. I mean, I don't think any of us had heard of movie pass eight months ago. And yeah. yet here we are with them making major studio development plays. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. So the US FCC sent letters to Amazon and eBay asking the companies to help remove listings for pay fake pay TV boxes. The FCC is involved because boxes often display the FCC logo to imply they've been certified when they have not. Amazon and eBay already proactively remove boxes that facilitate pi piracy. The FCC just wants them to do better and move faster, as well as cooperate by sharing information with the FCC about the manufacturers. It seems to me, I, I, I don't know, Tom and Ken, how I feel about this, because it seems like they're dangerously close to banning objects because they're capable of piracy, which I don't like. But I do understand the need to ban them based on the idea that their advertising or marketing promotes 
piracy. Yeah. And that, that is what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your fire TV box is capable of piracy. They're not going after that. Uh, just having Cody on a box is not enough to, to, to raise the FCC's ire. And, and even if the box is certified, it doesn't have to be fake certification. If that FCC label is on there, the FCC can say you can't promote criminal activity. And if you're saying get all the TV for free without paying cable, it's like, well, how are you doing that? And we need to investigate that and we need to stop that. That, that mm -hmm. uh, That's what the FCC is saying anyway. And that's kind of where we've been since Napster, which is being capable isn't enough. But if you promote the capability, then you get shut down. Yeah. Makes me remember those weird days of the mid '90s where pe people were trying to ban the MP3 format, full stop. Yeah, like, right. Stop exactly. compressing no. things. And the, and the FCC is not doing that. They're saying, look, that too good to be true box uh, is in fact too good to be true. You you, we, you need to help us crack down. And it, and they're actually being nice about it in this case. Amazon and eBay have been helping. The FCC is just sending them a letter to say, hey, what can we do to improve this? We we need to we need to stop these fraudulent boxes. Because a lot of people, we get these emails all the time at Cord Killers, like, hey, I saw this box. This looks like a really good deal. And we have to explain, like, it's probably fraud. Uh, and they, you know, might have malware on them. They might not, uh, but you might get in trouble. But you might not, but don't buy it. <laughs> that, right. That's generally the answer. All right, let's check out the dispatches from the front. So Brad ran into something when seeing Solo he hadn't seen before. AMC does $5 ticket Tuesdays for Stubbs members. He says, I ordered my ticket at the box office. They gave me the total, $5 and some change. I handed my movie pass over to pay and was told I couldn't have the discounted price if I was paying with movie pass. She updated the transaction and charged me full price, which was more than $11. Now, it didn't matter to me since it didn't come out of my pocket. But I imagine MoviePass doesn't appreciate the policy. I know AMC and MoviePass don't get along, but is this even a legal practice? It seems a little shady to charge a different price based on what card the customer is paying with. I imagine that if I had bought the ticket at one of the self-checkout kiosks, the transaction would have went through fine, and AMC wouldn't even have known I was using MoviePass. Just thought it was interesting. And if anyone could provide insight here, it would be Tom Merritt. Ugh. I don't know about that. Uh, thanks, guys. Love the show. Been listening since the early frame rate days. So let me let me pitch this to you, Tom. I'm going to say, uh, is it uh, slimy feeling? Yes. Um, is it legal? I would say 100 percent, because if you're an independent business, you get to decide what you're going to charge for different methods of payments or whatever. And I'm going to go so far as to say this is. We, we've had stories where it appears that AMC was not a fan of MoviePass, and this seems like a very smart leverage play for AMC to make, where they offer it and they keep reminding people that, oh, you are a MoviePass customer, you're a second-rate citizen, and you're going to get a second-rate experience. You're not going to get the benefits, the discounts, all of the special stuff that we offer our regular customers. However, if you're in our alternate competitor to MoviePass, then maybe that'll be worth it. Like tactically and, and i'm trying to divorce myself from the emotion of how slimy this feels in the moment tactically this seems like a smart play for amc to make if what they want to do is establish a foothold against the 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 impending power of movie pass and, and i think they have the legality to do it like you say they can decide what payments they accept the argument against amc not taking movie pass is it's just mastercard you're not losing anything right uh and, and it's hard to block it unless you notice like this key like this person did like you said if he'd gone to the kiosk it might have gone through however I think MoviePass is fine with this, and here's why. MoviePass's proposition is we're giving people into your regular stuff. If you cooperate with us, then we can upsell them into your more expensive stuff, like your 3D movies. That's why 3D movies aren't part of MoviePass, right? MoviePass doesn't pay for the 3D movies. This is like that. They're saying, hey, uh, MoviePass is like, yeah, we don't want to be combined with other discounts. That's our value proposition is that we can bring the people in and then move them into stubs. Uh, so I don't think MoviePass would be that upset about it. They certainly don't care about the difference between 5 and $11. They're burning money like crazy. 
So uh, we have, I I have to think, Tom, that the letter I'm about to read is a result of you not being there, because if you were there, you most certainly would have clarified all this. But we got an email from Richard who says, uh, feedback for Cord Killers. I just finished listening to last week's episode of Cord Killers. The discussion about how TiVo Alexa skill works is kind of all wrong. Your TiVo doesn't become an Alexa device. You use your existing Alexa-enabled device to control your TiVo, pretty much the same method that Dish uses. In theory, it's pretty slick. Luckily, it doesn't actually work the way Martin and tried to trigger it, uh, 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 though my echo did wake up multiple times while I was listening. Oh, he's talking about uh, uh, Martin Thomas. Um, yeah, yeah, he definitely used the A word. We we didn't tell him about the etiquette on the show of, of trying to avoid apologies triggering people's uh, devices. Um, I'm pretty sure that we knew that. And I apologize if it miscommunicated uh, for the way that it went out. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that's what we said. Yeah, I thought that's what we said, too. But, uh, but uh, apologies if it came across any other way. And then uh, finally, an anonymous Diamond Clubber wrote, I'm a supervisor at an AMC movie theater and wanted to clear up some stuff with the person who used Movie Pass last week and got his points used up. First of all, when your points are activated, it automatically uses those dollars on the first purchase. It has been like this at least since I started working for AMC in October of 2016, so it definitely has nothing to do with Movie Pass. When you talk to a person, they're supposed to ask if you want to activate your points or not, and when you go to the kiosk, it only activates if you did so on your AMC app. Secondly, shortly after the MoviePass price drop, AMC changed their terms of service for the Stubbs program, and it's actually against the terms of service now to use MoviePass along with Stubbs, hence our earlier email. This is partially because AMC doesn't want people scamming the system and checking into movies just earn Stubbs points, something I'll admit I had done back during the $35 a month days, and partially so that people don't end up in situations like Mark's. AMC's weekly memo system is a little weird, so it's possible not all crew members know this, but all the managers should. As far as AMC and MoviePass goes, the company has sort of indoctrinated its associates into disliking MoviePass since the higher-ups don't like it. MoviePass also causes problems from time to time when difficult patrons expect something from us when MoviePass itself is having the problem and we're not able to help. So there's definitely some resentment from AMC employees over it, which might explain the manager's glee when he told Mark that his points had been used. I hope this clears up some stuff regarding MoviePass and AMC stubs. Feel free to follow up with me if there are any questions about this stuff. Well, thank you for the insight, the, the even-handed insight from the person who knows. I like that. Yeah, man. Uh, how great is it, Tom, that we've got insiders all over the world who could just send us little anonymous notes like that. Network of agents. If you everywhere. guys have something anonymous that you'd like to share with us, make sure to hit us up over at cordkillers at gmail.com. We love your emails. And in fact, if you want to be part of that network and expand it out even more, you got to check out Ritual Misery with Kent. Heck yeah. Every, every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Pacific – on uh, twitch.tv slash ritual misery join us we have a, a fun little show where we have guests on we geek out about uh, sci-fi fantasy uh, uh, tech whatever whatever geeky thing that our guest wants to talk about we will geek out for about an hour it's a it's a good time so check us out over there I'll vouch for it, man. Ritual Misery is a lot of fun, and they are the hardest of the hardcore Diamond Club. If you've enjoyed all of Diamond Club's programming over the years please 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 uh, drop in and hang out with the Ritual Misery gang our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. And we're live on twitch.tv slash night attack. Also carried on the old diamondclub.tv. Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We'll cut your cords again next week. Hey, guys. Brian and Tom here. And it's just the same old message at the end of the credits, just like always. That's right, Brian. Nothing new here except your name showing up. Oh, my gosh. Because I've you got a just name. supported us on Patreon. Yeah, all those $5 donors. Look at that. That's your name in pixels. When we're going to make you famous, kid, put your There's name in pixels on the internet. There's names in there, but some of you are new. Some of you aren't there. It's sad. What can they do, Brian? I mean, they could go to patreon.com slash cord killers and pledge $5 an episode to be one of these amazing people like this the one. Amazing. Oh, look at look at that name right there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>